This is the Our Voices Matter project. My name is Anna Kwan, and I'm interviewing John Patterson at the Gorsebrook Institute on the St. Mary's University campus on October 19th, 2010. Hi, John. Hello. Thank, thank you for coming to be interviewed today. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me first um, where and when you were born? I was born in Charlottetown in April of 1939. Okay, and what day in April? 8th of April. Um, and did you grow up there? Until I was 14, yes. Okay. Um, and what was it like growing up in your family? Well, I would say that we had a rather a dysfunctional family. And uh, I remember somebody saying that uh, all functional families are the same. All dysfunctional families are unique, mm -hmm. but um, anyway, um, my father was much older than, than my mother, and uh, he had somewhat of a hostility towards women, and this used to show up when they would uh, argue. He would sometimes blow up at her and say, oh yes, Madam Queen, uh, but um, Anyway, um, my mother, I don't feel, was all that stable, um, but um, I, she was never diagnosed as such. Now, of course, this is, 19, this is in the 1900s when uh, <clears throat> they might be reluctant to diagnose a person as such because it could lead to hospitalization, and hospitals then were not not very uh, good places to put a, mm. uh, a person there and they didn't have any <coughs> uh, very very good facilities right. but um, my father as I said my father was much older than my mother 20 years older and sometimes he treated her as if as if she were a child and uh, but uh, we, he uh, there was no affection between them displayed or he never showed uh, much uh, physical affection. But I understand this was common at that time, that uh, people did not hug and kiss in front of their children, and uh, they never did that. I think she would have liked to have had, had that, but it, it, didn't, it, it didn't take place. Yeah. And were you close to your mother and father? Well, I guess I would say yes. Um, <clears throat> but things sort of changed. My father, as he got older, he got deaf. And he was under a lot of stress because his job was a teacher. And uh, he started to get deaf. And uh, I remember him. None of my family remembers him as I do before he could, uh, before he grew deaf. When he before he was deaf, he could hear a whisper, but at the last part of his life, we had to shout at him to make him understand. Right. And uh, he was worried that he might lose his job as a teacher. Mm. He taught at a community college there. That is, that's what it is now. And um, he taught mathematics. Okay. And did you have siblings? Yes, I have two younger brothers and two younger sisters. Okay. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And what was your relationship like with your siblings? Um, I guess good. I felt that my brother, who was next to me, I, I feel in, re in retrospect that he and I picked on the youngest brother quite a bit. And I think it showed in his, uh, in his uh, behavior that, uh, for example, he, uh, he was prone to uh, bedwetting and um, soiling his pants well after he should have gotten over it. And um, it caused a lot of grief for my mother. 
And my father would blow up at him. He thought he was just too lazy to go to the bathroom. He thought mm -hmm. he was too lazy to wake up at night. Mm -hmm. But eventually he got over it and he became a, a very successful person in life. Mm -hmm. And he was very good to me. <clears throat> He's very good to all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was my mother's, I think he was my mother's favorite. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but one thing that my father was very uh, angry about was any reference to sex. He thought sex in itself was a dirty word. Mm. And uh, he would he would sometimes use it in a der der derisive manner to describe any kind of interest in sexual uh, in sexual matters at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned about <clears throat> what you might call basic sexuality from a friend down the street who was older than me, mm -hmm. and he made it sound very very dirty. Mm. And. Uh, he, he had a dirty mind, he did, he really did. Mm. Um, I know that might, um, that's a theme that we'll explore, because um, we talked about it a bit yesterday. A bit. Yeah. Um, but I'll, maybe I'll ask you some questions about your school and what that was like for you um, first. Mm -hmm. um, so, can you tell me about what it was like for you to going to school? Well, I started at the usual age, mm -hmm. six years old, mm -hmm. and we taught at a small school which was in this community college. This community college, you see, trained teachers, and they had a school where the teachers could uh, be trained in. Okay. And um, I went there, and uh, I was brilliant. Uh, I could do um, reading before I went to school. My father, my father would read to me uh, by his side, and he would trace the 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 lines as he went on. And before too long, I could read along with him, and he was that. And he taught me simple mathematics, and I could catch on to that. So there was nothing that he could teach me in grade one. So I was put into grade two, and then I proceeded there until I was put into uh, grade six. And uh, uh, I was, how old was I? I was uh, 10 years old, I turned grade six, I turned, grade, turned 11 in grade six in April. And um, Europe Provincial examinations after grade eight for um, uh, entry to grade nine and uh, my father had me write these uh, exams meant for a grade eight graduate he had me write these after grade six mm -hmm. and I passed them and I was entered I entered grade nine at the age of eleven mm -hmm. now um, <coughs> It was around this time that he told me that he had had heart troubles mm -hmm. and a doctor had told him he didn't have long to live and he told me that um, that <clears throat> he, it was up to me to study hard and, and do well in school so that I could support the family. And as you may ex ex expect, this was a crushing burden to place on an 11-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And I sort of pushed it out of my mind in a lot of ways. And uh, when I entered grade 9, the teacher there, who was a nice woman, she said to me, John, you know, what, what is, what's behind this? She said, uh, what's the rush for you to get through school? Mm. And I, I was quite cocky, and I said, well, if I could do it, why not try? Mm. And she said, well, all right. So we used to uh, have uh, monthly, we would, we would get uh, graded as that. One month, she said, well, third this month is John. Now, this is in a class of about 30 students. And you had your name in the paper, and uh, that you had come third. But uh, 
I was not a balanced student. I was much smarter in mathematics, which my father, my father, that and I, I, I. But I guess I must have done all right in in the other courses in geography and French and history and English. I must have done all right. Mm -hmm. I don't remember much about them. But sometimes my father would bring me down to the classes he was teaching in, in mathematics and would have me do ma ma mathematics in front of the students just to show how, how good I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was sometimes brought in to read and I could read at any level and understand it. Mm. Yeah. So that's how things went up until grade 10. Right. And what was your um, behavior like in school? Well, I didn't make trouble, but uh, I didn't, I had diff difficulty relating to my, my uh, the, the, the other students liked me, they did. But at the same time, I wasn't comfortable because, you know, they, they were dating and the, the boys would talk about their sexual experiences. And um, this wasn't something I could share. And um, <clears throat> of course, and, and uh, for my own age group, I wasn't very popular um, because some of them bullied me. Now, I would say about bullying, it was a two-way street because sometimes I would be the bully. Now this this may be true of a lot of cases. Uh, I don't know. We, there's, there's quite an emphasis today on bullying. Mm. And I sometimes wonder if in certain circumstances if the child who is bullied may also be a bully. Mm -hmm. Have you ever uh, run across that? I think I've heard stuff about that, yeah. 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 And um, I was in active in, in Wolf Cubs, that's the younger younger uh, classification for Boy Scouts. Right. Uh, but uh, I never went to camp because I was afraid of the water. And uh, I had heard that in camp the, they would throw you in the water to make you swim. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go because I didn't want to be thrown in the water, mm. and I never went to camp. Okay. And um, when you were a child, um, were you ever ill physically or emotionally? I I would often get ill in the middle of winter. I apparently I got bronchial pneumonia sometimes, mm -hmm. and I would be sent to my grandmother's my grandparents' farm in New Brunswick, and I just loved it there. I just loved it. They were good to mm -hmm. me. The food was good. My mother never could cook very well, and mm -hmm. we didn't have good food anyway in Charlottetown. In the winter, mm -hmm. it wasn't like today when you can get fresh produce and, mm -hmm. and fresh that, but it, we, we didn't, we, and also, my father was trying to save money for, uh, for if he should die. He, he tried very hard to save money. And uh, consequently, we, we didn't have a lot. And I remember, um, but I'll, I'll just stick to the subject. I would go to my grandparents' farm, and I just loved it on the farm, the farm life. The boys I would meet in the neighborhood, we would play hockey together. And um, um, good food and I would get healthy in no time and then I would go back home, back back home to Charlottetown. But, um, uh, oh yes, as I say, my father was trying to save money mm -hmm. and we lived in uh, the poor area of town. Mm -hmm. Although he didn't have, he didn't make much money as a teacher then mm -hmm. in the community college, he didn't make much money. And I know later on, when I was in going to university and I got a summer job out in Ontario, I was going to be paid a dollar ninety-five an hour, and he told me that he had never made that much money. Now that was in 1957, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, you know, a dollar ninety-five an hour then was very good pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, when when you were a child, did anyone close to you die, or um, or did you ever move when you were a child, and and how did that affect you? Um, we moved. We were living in a uh, a large house. Uh, we had an apartment in a large house in Charlottetown. Mm -hmm. And the house was sold and the new owner converted to apartments, uh, small apartments. And we had to move. So we moved to another part of town which was uh, a nicer home and we had oil heat and instead of coal we had oil heat. I think the rent, the rent was thirty dollars a month, and um, that was a move. We moved to a new neighborhood, but it wasn't a wealthy neighborhood by any means. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a rather slummy area. But indeed, a lot of tra of uh, of uh, at that time was a poor area. Mm. You know. Okay. Yeah. And did you ever? Um experienced surgery for physical problems as a child or later in your life? Surgery? Yeah. Uh, I had my tonsils out when I was quite young, okay. but I came through that quite well. I didn't, I wasn't traumatized by being in hospital, right. um, mm -hmm. although I, I had to go to the bathroom once. I was under orders to call the nurse if I needed to, to use the bedpan. Or you know to 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 or to the urinal, mm -hmm. and I tried to wake up the boy. There's only one buzzer bu bu buzzer for four for students, oh. for, 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 for four children. There's only one buzzer, and uh, I couldn't wake the boy up. I whispered to him to, so I got out of bed and went to the bathroom. And I didn't flush the toilet, and when the nurse came in the morning and saw that there somebody had urinated in the toilet. She was quite angry, mm. and but uh, I tried to explain to her that I couldn't wake wake him up. Mm -hmm. We should have all had a buzzer, of course, but they they were poor, uh, poor hospital. They couldn't afford a buzzer for everybody. Right. Yeah. Did you experience mental health problems as a child? I can't say I did. No. No, I can't say I did. Mm -hmm. I wasn't happy all the time. I know my father once was talking about me to my mother and he said, John's not happy. And uh, my father believed a great deal in, in spanking. I used mm -hmm. to get spanking a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, for every in, for every infraction of the rules. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother, she, she wasn't perfect. I, I liked her better, but my mother could not condone uh, 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 disobedience. She would, she would give great punishment if you disobeyed her for any reason. Mm -hmm. And um, I know one time I went to a movie that she didn't want me to go to. I went with, it, with another boy. And she wouldn't let me go to a movie again for a whole year. Mm -hmm. Now that's a long time when you're a small boy and uh, other things. But she would also say she was going to take me or do something for me. And then I would break a rule or do something wrong and she would not live up to her word. So I soon learned that I couldn't depend on her to keep her word. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, it's very hard for a small child to be good all the mm -hmm. time, to not not do right all the time, and uh, and she she would break her word. Right. Okay. Were you ever institutionalized as a child or young person? Were institutionalized as uh, um, uh, for uh, punishment or, uh, or more, treatment or? Yeah, more. Well, either one actually. No, yeah. no, no. Well, they, they didn't institutionalize children then anyway. You're talking about the 1940s and, and 50s. And, uh, well, they did have reform schools for, for, for disobedient children, but I never went to one, no. Right. Okay. So now, um, well, before we move on, would you like a glass of water? Um, or? 
There's yeah, one why not? Oh, I'll have a glass okay. of water. Let me pour it for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now let's start with some questions about your mental health history and encounters with the mental health system. Mm. Can you remember the onset of your mental illness? Oops. Yes. Did you drop something? I did. That's okay. That's already okay. okay. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, to begin at the beginning, um, I was. It was in 1965 when I was 26 years old. I was in university studying engineering. Now, that seems quite late for me to be studying engineering, but I had already started studying engineering and I dropped out due to a lack of funds and I, I didn't want to take any more from my parents to, to go to college. So I had dropped out of university and worked for four years and then I went uh, back to study engineering. And uh, in 1965, I was uh, in British Columbia, and my employer gave us psychological, tested us in a lot of different ways for um, <clears throat> intelligence and also for word association dealing with um, to assess your, your, your reactions to words. And we had an interview afterwards with a psychologist and he said that one of the tests had indicated that I should be doing much better in university than I was and they also suggested that I was troubled and might need to see a psychiatrist and uh, so he said we could we could have you see one here if you like in this small town in British Columbia and I said well no I said uh, I'll be going to Halifax I said it's better to wait for that now, I had already agreed that I was going to be editor of the school paper in, uh, in, in Halifax at this university uh, where I was studying engineering. It's now part of Dalhousie, but at that time it was an independent university it was called Nova Scotia Technical College. And uh, I was apprehensive about it because I didn't know how I was going to write. I wasn't much at writing. And when I told my father that I was going to do it, his first reaction was, he says, you can't do it. And uh, when I came back, it was very hard for me to do it. And I neglected my studies very much. And uh, I would uh, <clears throat> be nervous all the time about getting the paper ready. And I neglected, as I said, I've already said, I don't want to repeat myself, but I really let my studies go because once the paper came out I was so relieved of it that I just relaxed and uh, finally I'm not sure what what convinced me to go but I did go to, to get referred to a psychiatrist and uh, he was quite a distinguished psychiatrist he was a very good man uh, I think he's dead now he probably only must be I'm 71 and so he was at least uh, 15 years older than me, or maybe 20 years older than me, and uh, he was very, he, he did his best, the man did his best, but he treated me so seriously that I began to feel that something was indeed very wrong, and he gave me the pills. Now, I didn't expect pills, I expected psychotherapy, mm -hmm. but he gave me pills, and I would take them, and one day I got feeling shaky in class and I left the classroom and walked around town eating pills and uh, then I <clears throat> went in to see him and his first reaction was shock. He said, how many of those pills have you taken? And I said, mm -hmm. I don't know. And he said, well, he said, here, here's, a, here's a, a prescription. Go down and get yourself some because I was shaky and he you had me a prescription. Did you ever hear of chlorpromazine? I have, yes. That was the major tranquilizer of the day. 
and I took I took that, and then I was I had arranged I was going to go home to visit my parents, and I just got on the train and I collapsed and just dozed all the way. I was in an empty car, mm -hmm. and the conductor conductor found me. He said, "What's the trouble?" I said, "Tired," and but I straightened out by the time we got to Sackville, where my parents were living then, and uh, I was okay. But I, 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 I'm trying my best to uh, tell you. But anyway, um, to carry on, uh, after my, my doctor persuaded me to stop being editor of the paper, to give it up. And uh, so uh, I did. But I had a sense of failure. But the only thing was that I still kept my hand in because I was my editorials were called the best in the Maritimes by an editor from the Globe and Mail. And so the new editor said, Why don't you write the editorials and I'll take care of the rest of it? So I did. But then um, I took a train ride home again to visit my parents. This was in the spring of 1966 mm. and I had some beer on the, on the trains and my father didn't want me to drink and I got home and I felt afraid that he was going to know I had drank and I felt very tense and I got into uh, a, uh, a um, condition known as panic. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. You have. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. It was just terrible. I couldn't relax. I couldn't sleep. At the same time, I couldn't stay awake. I was nodding and I, I, in, the, in the waiting room, but I could not relax and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. I could not get my mind on anything except myself. Mm -hmm. And I would not, and I, it happened to me later on in life too, once. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I never want to experience that again, but I don't think I ever will because a lot of sources of stress are gone into my life. I no longer have a job. I have a pension, and uh, I have support in the uh, in the connections. I love the staff there, and everything is fine. Yeah. So that was my how I started uh, in in mental health. Okay. Um. Maybe I can just ask for clarification. Um, was it a panic attack? Is that what you were diagnosed with, or would you? Did you? Get I don't know. I don't know about a panic attack. Yeah. Um. I don't know if you would recognize that as a panic attack. Mm. Okay. Um. I don't know how to answer that. It was a, a, a form of depression known as panic. Oh, okay. Uh, it wasn't where you're running around <coughs> trying to uh, um, get um, free of some situation. Uh, yeah. I was, it was just uh, not being able to relax or, or feel good about anything or... or okay not being able to get your mind off yourself. Right. Okay. Um, and what was your diagnosis, um, you know, when your doctor... Depression. Gave pills? Okay. Okay. Um, do Depression you and anxiety. Yeah. And you were saying you didn't expect to be given pills. No. Um, but... I had never... I had never heard of them, really. I, I, I was... Surprised. I was started off on something called Librium, and uh, and then I got a stronger form of of uh, tranquilizer, and then we came into uh, chlorpromazine, which is very strong, antipsychotic. Yes. And how long did you take uh, chlorpromazine for? Oh, years. Um, I guess. Um, until, 
Well, I started taking lithium because I became manic at a later time. I became manic and was later diagnosed with antidepressants. And after that, I took lithium to combat that. But I still think I also took chlorpromazine. And uh, I uh, finally got off that. Oh, I guess in my 50s when they got something called Dianol Pro-X, okay. which is a mood stabilizer, and I haven't taken chlorpromazine since. Sometimes I have a yearning for it, because if you don't take chlorpromazine for a while, and then take it, it just knocks you right out and you sleep. Mm. You know, you, you really do get a good night's sleep. And sometimes, sometimes, I yearn for it, yeah. but I don't want it because it made me react to sunlight mm -hmm. and I'd get a very red face mm -hmm. and terribly uncomfortable, prickle, prickly and burning and you never get over it. You never, you never get used to it. You never get, uh, you never get a tan or anything like that. Your face is mm -hmm. very, very red, like a lobster. Right. Yeah. Um. In your early experience with the mental health system, um, did you did anything help you? That was uh, any sort of treatment help you? I guess I'm wondering whether the pills did what they were supposed to in your mind. Whether there were any other treatments that um, were helpful. No, it was just the pills um, for a long time. Um, I never got into group therapy. No. You might, you might, you see, to um, to go on a little bit further from 1966 when I collapsed and uh, was hospitalized. I didn't tell you, but I was hospitalized in the VG after uh, my manic attack, or after my panic, after my panic disorder. I was hospitalized in the VG for a few weeks. Was that in 1966? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then I dropped out of college and I went back. Mm -hmm. they, they wanted me to stay in Halifax and get treatment and go back and finish up in engineering, but I didn't have any more money anyway. So I went up to Quebec, and uh, my doctors advised against it, but I went up, and I had a very, very hard time. I didn't have any therapy. You know, I, I, I couldn't speak French well enough, and they, they couldn't speak English well enough, but I took the pills, chlorpromazine. That's all I took. And uh, the French family I stayed with as a boarder, they were very kind to me. But then the summer came to an end, and of course I wasn't a good worker. I wasn't a, they wanted me to do things. They must have wondered what was wrong with me, with my red face and all that. And sometimes I would be very, but uh, I got through the summer, and I came back, and I got a job in uh, Glace Bay, in Cape Breton. Mm -hmm. I got a job there as a process operator. I don't know if you know what a process operator does. Well, you turn valves and you operate remote controls okay. to control a process. So I was there for uh, two and a half years. And uh, I didn't tell them when I went there <clears throat> that I had, had a breakdown because they would not have given me the job. That's the only type of work that I had experience in, was as this process operator. Mm -hmm. But it's regarded as a high stress job, and they would not have hired me. And I wanted to work. I didn't want to, you know, there was nothing else I could do. Or I was going welfare, mm -hmm. I, and of course that wouldn't give me much money. And where would I stay? I didn't want to stay with my parents anymore. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, things went better for me until I changed my job and became an inspector. For that now, an inspector is somebody. Oh, I won't go into it. It's just uh, inspector, inspect maintenance work, and 
inspect things in the plant to see if they were starting to corrode. And we got a new boss, and he was very hard to work for. And once again, I went into a panic uh, of depression, uh, fearing him. I feared him. But I got over that, I got, came out of that, and then, now that's a long time ago, that's where, 1969 now. And uh, <clears throat> it looked as if the plant was going to shut down. It was corroded out, and it wasn't operating properly, and there were an awful lot of things wrong with it. There were leaks in the pipes from uh, the corrosive nature of seawater, so I knew that it wasn't going to stay operating much longer. Yeah. And I went to a similar plant in a place called Port Hawkesbury, Nova Scotia, on the Strait of Canso. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went there as an operator once again. And once again I lied to get my job. And that's when I had my first panic, uh, not panic, a manic, manic attack. Mm -hmm. I had my manic attack there. There was a dangerous situation in the plant and I performed very well, so I thought, and I thought I was a hero, mm -hmm. as a manic, you know, I wasn't a hero at all. I thought I'd done a lot more than I did. But anyway, I was in hospital for a while, and I was severely manic, and uh, they were nervous, the doctors were nervous about having me there. My psychiatrist put me in there because he didn't want to send me to Nova Scotia Hospital. Mm -hmm. But I got sent so he went sat there, and I, but after a while, I wouldn't take my pills, and that that, and the other doctors didn't want me there at all because who knows what a manic patient will do? You know, you might go pull needles out of people's arms. You don't know what you might do, and so uh, anyway, I went home with my parents for this for Christmas. This all happened before Christmas, and then uh, I was given a job writing standard procedures and uh, but I was aware that um, the plant was a hazardous place to work because you could get a leak at any time of of, uh, of poisonous gas and I became manic I think two more times and then I went back to college. My, my mother died, first my father died then my mother died and I got some uh, some uh, money from her estate when I died, mm -hmm. and I went back in 1977 to uh, the university where I studied engineering, and took mm -hmm. engineering. Uh, are we are we doing okay? You're doing this? great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're getting along. 1977. Mm -hmm. In 1978, I had finished my first year and done well, mm -hmm. and I looked for a summer job. And there was a job opened up in an oil refinery across the uh, across the uh, harbor here in right. here in Halifax, over the Dartmouth side. Right. And I took it, and it was very good pay. But once again, I lied about my medical medical history because they never would have hired me if they'd known that I was mentally so-so uh, taking pills. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, I finished the summer, and I told my co-workers that uh, that I had uh, had been uh, uh, mental, and uh, they. Uh, oh, in in the meantime, in the meantime, I must go back. Sure. I told you that I had had manic attacks, yeah. and they put me this time in the Nova Scotia Hospital for them. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, I told them, my co-workers there on my last day, that I had been in Nova Scotia Hospital and they, then I was very proud of the fact that I had done, gotten through this the job, the, the job. But, and I, I blew sky high. I was registered, I was doing okay, but I, I went manic attack, severely manic. Yeah. And, uh, so that knocked me out of that year at college, but mm -hmm. I stayed in Halifax mm -hmm. and I found jobs yeah. to uh, put, put me through 
And uh, I went the following year back to college. And uh, that brings us to, I got my degree in 1980. I should have got it in, in 79, but due to the fact I missed a year, I didn't get it until 1980. Right. And I got a very good job out in Alberta at the oil, at the oil uh, company mm -hmm. there. And I was, I was open with them. I, I had my psychiatrist do my medical, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> this is in 1980. Yeah. So anyway, they were reluctant to take me on. They offered me the job first, but when they got my medical, they were reluctant to take me on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went out there, and I stopped taking chlorpromazine, and uh, I couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't sleep, mm -hmm. but I would be awake all night. Sometimes I'd go into work and work at night. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'd go to the emergency department of the hospitals and just sit there and put in the night. And uh, <clears throat> but I would take the chlorpromazine on the weekends, and it would knock me out, and I would get my sleep. Mm -hmm. And uh, some doctors thought it was all right, and some doctors didn't know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they sent me up to the uh, a uh, uh, a place up north in a, a camp, mm -hmm. oil camp, to get prior to experience. You see, my immediate bosses did not know about this. Only the only the uh, only the uh, the company doctor knew about my condition. Mm -hmm. the, the company doctor and probably the personnel manager. Right. But on my way up to the camp. I called, I went in to see the company doctor and uh, told him I was apprehensive of going up north mm -hmm. because I said uh, of this and he said, you're supposed to be cured. And I saw right away, I said I was afraid somebody might tease me about being from uh, the Maritimes and being backward. Mm -hmm. And he said, I saw he wasn't my friend. The doctor wasn't my friend, so mm -hmm. I said, oh, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. And uh, I wasn't all right. I found that uh, the living, you're living with your job, you're living in a camp, and you're going to an office in a camp. And uh, I, 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 told him, I told the boss I had I couldn't come back. Anyway, we won't go into details. The, up, the, up, the, uh, the end result was that they told me to go on part-time for the time being mm -hmm. and they kept me on half pay and uh, I got another job there with a consulting firm at the same pay, very good pay. Okay. They gave me very good pay yeah. and I got another job there and I did well with them for a while but then my brother came out to Alberta <laughs> to visit me mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, <clears throat> spent the weekend together and uh, we went, lived there. We went uh, around uh, uh, to visit other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a snowstorm, and uh, he missed his flight back. And he was sort of sour with me. He thought it was my fault mm -hmm. that that, and that hurt me. And I thought I was depressed, and I told, I told him, that I was in a state of depression, and uh, and I, I refused to get well. I could have, should have, not have given in, mm -hmm. but I did, and they let me go. Okay. That's in 1982, okay. and yeah. that brings us. Do you have any questions now? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's 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 start, let's stop my story for a while. <laughs> and okay. Well, you're doing really well, and uh, I guess one thing I thought we might want to go backwards a bit. Uh, Surely. Because last night when we talked, um, you mentioned sort of issues with sexuality. Yes. And that that was a major problem for you when you first got ill, or when you first were treated by the mental health system. Yes. Is that correct? Well, yeah. you see, um, um, <clears throat> when I was promoted into grade nine, mm. well, of course, um, 
the boys and girls were dating then. And uh, I felt at a place in that regard. And I was afraid to ask a girl for a date. And uh, when I went to college, I was still very young. I only was going through puberty when I entered college at the age of 16. And I was very undersized. And um, so I, I didn't ask her for dates, <clears throat> even though I, I, I shot up in my second year. I, I became quite uh, tall. And I would have liked to have taken on a girl, but I was afraid. I was afraid of girls very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father <clears throat> took a very dim view of anything to do with that. You know, he he came into my room one time in my residence, and we had a uh, a flyer there about the engineer's princess for Campus Queen, oh. and he looked at that. And he said, "Is that your girlfriend?" I had never taken a girl out. I had no money to take a girl out. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't give me any spending money. He wouldn't. He thought I should do without spending money. And my mother would give me money to, to spend at the uh, coffee house that we had on campus. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the only source of spending money I had. Um, I didn't have any money to spend on things like a stapler or, or uh, paper clips or, or uh, file folders or anything like that to organize my work. Yeah. Everything was in a shambles on my desk. Yeah. And, um, that's how hard up I was for money, and uh, but uh, um, so I had my first date at the age of twenty when I went up to work in the mines. I finished Mount Allison with my engineering diploma at the age of twenty, mm -hmm. and I went up to work in the mines in Ontario in 1920 for the summer, and uh, there were a bunch of us took out some nurses. And we just went to a, a, a lounge for that, and uh, mm -hmm. I didn't kiss her. I, I, I'm not sure how it went, but she said right to me, you know, she liked me. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, um, I, when I got to Halifax at the age of 20, the first, remember now, I, I took two, two attempts at engineering, yeah. the first one at the age of 20. The second one at the age of uh, of uh, the age of 25. In the meantime, I had been out working, but I did meet girls then when I was in St. John working, mm -hmm. and I did meet girls, and uh, I did take them out. But I would find something wrong with them. They were they were good girls. They liked me, and and I, 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 I but I would reject them, you know, for some reason. But there was one girl that I met when I, I left St. John and went to Port Hawkesbury, not the second time that I'm talking about when I uh, became manic, okay. but in the meantime I, I went to another place in Port Hawkesbury mm -hmm. and uh, I met a girl there and uh, I was very fond of her, but Anna, I was screwed up. I, I, I uh, I rejected her too, but at the same time I was very attracted to her, mm -hmm. and she and she was good to me. But she couldn't understand what was wrong with me, mm -hmm. and uh, I just uh, I don't know. I, I just talking about it confuses me. Yeah. But uh, I just wonder if someday we'll meet again. She's been married since, and had mm -hmm. children. I don't know if her husband is still living or not. But at the same time, if she ever becomes free again. Now she'll be in her 60s at this time, but uh, if her husband ever dies, I want to see her again and, and take her out. Okay. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. Is that good so, enough? Sure, but I guess I'm interested to know, like, when, when the psychologist said you should see a psychiatrist, was it to do with your issues around sexuality or... Well, yes, or I, I think so. I, I, because that's what I thought was my major, <clears throat> my major problem was sexuality. Mm -hmm. But we never dealt with that. He, he was too busy getting me to um, 
resign as, as editor of the school paper to deal right. with his sexuality problems. Okay. Yeah. So but I did meet a girl at that time who was nice to me. Mm -hmm. She was a Mount Allison graduate too, and I did date her while I was sick, and she was okay. good to me. Okay, right. Now you mentioned being in the Nova Scotia Hospital. Do you remember how many times you were in the Nova Scotia Hospital? Or other, like a psychiatric facility? I think it was three times altogether. Okay. There was twice while I was manic and while I was at uh, Port Hawkesbury in this plant that was dangerous to work in and I became manic. Right. There was twice at that time and then a third time when I was in this oil refinery and I was supposed to register for my final year of engineering right. and I went sky high then and they took me in that time too and that's mm -hmm. when I really started to calm down and uh, not get not get manic anymore and not get severely injured is it? Yeah. yeah. I was also in the Abbey Lane shortly mm -hmm. after that last trip to the uh, um, uh, uh, no Scotia yeah. Hospital. Yeah. The same time I was in, but it was for a short time, and I wasn't okay. severely sick. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I think it was three times in No Scotia Hospital. Okay. And when you were in that No Scotia Hospital the last time, you said you were calming down, not getting manic anymore. Was it due to the treatment you were receiving? I think or? so. They gave me shock okay. treatments. Yeah. yeah. And how did you feel about that? Well, I kind of dreaded that because, uh, like, they would put you under with an anesthetic and you would feel a rush coming up. Mm. So I sort of dreaded that. Um, they gave me the chlorpromazine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so do you feel the, these are the things that helped your mania or was it that they talked to you or was it I think else? the shock treatments did the help shock me. Helped. But okay. um and uh did you I, sorry. Mm, go ahead. Well did you have shock treatments at any other time besides that time? No. 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 Okay. The three times I was there I took shock treatments. But in the last in the last time, I tried to commit suicide in the hospital. Okay. I was trusted patient, and I could keep my razor blades in, in the nursing station. Mm -hmm. So one time I went in there to get them, and they said, what do you want, Mr. Patterson? And I said, I'm going to commit suicide. And I went in and got a razor blade, and I went in the bathroom and started to slash my wrists. Mm -hmm. And then the orderly came, and to me and took the blade away from me and stood with me while they... I had had a vacation away and I guess that must have upset me for some reason. And uh, I hit the orderly and I hit him hard and then he put me on the floor but he didn't beat me up. No. But anyway I got more shock treatments after that. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the only time I've ever... I've considered um, suicide since then sometimes and when I in 1984 when I first went to Toronto I decided I was going to do it and I wrote my notes to people explaining that I was going to leave this world but I found when it came time to do it that I couldn't do it mm -hmm. and and I I've, I've rejected that since then I uh, I know I can't do it. I want to see what's going to happen tomorrow, and right now I'm I'm pretty happy. I so I I I I don't think I'm a strong wish for suicide. Even though I think about it sometimes, I can't do it. Okay. Do you want any more? Um. Well, maybe. Would you like to take a break for a minute? 
Or no, we're on a roll. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Unless my voice is, is starting to <laughs> No, right? it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. What would we do if we took um, a break? Anyway, what would we do? Well, you could drink some more and then we could talk about what you might want to talk about next. Um, it's up to you. <laughs> no, there's no sense taking a break. There's no sense taking a break. You will, okay. we'll, do, we'll, do, we'll do what you want to do. And okay. It might be another 20 minutes or half an hour. All is right. that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, um, when you look back on your the years uh, with a mental illness, um, can you tell me what what do you think was the most helpful for you in your recovery? Well, or would you even use that word recovery? I don't think I've ever really recovered, fully mm. recovered. Mm. Um, um, gee, yeah, that's a that's a good one. Um, well, all right, let's let's go to 1984. In 1982. Um, I was in Calgary, and you remember I said that I was working for a consulting firm right. and had been fired by them after a while because I wasn't doing any work. And my brother in, in Halifax, who is now dead, he invited me to come live with them. Okay. So I did and took care of his children. He gave me a few dollars and a free room and board. And then finally, I found I was fighting with them, so I went out to various places and took room and board. And I wasn't very stable, but I got low in money, and I went to Toronto, not knowing what lay ahead of me, but uh, just going there on the chance that I might get a job. So I went there. I spent. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what year? 1984. Okay. 1984, went to Toronto. Okay. And, yeah, this is my recovery. Um, I didn't have a job. I was on welfare, but I was working at, a, at work that you call working, getting paid under the table. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I got paid under the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... I started to relax and get better. I was sleeping and sleeping well. I started to get physically fit and it was it was just wonderful. And I was at that for four years. And uh, I lived in an apartment in the poor section of town full of cockroaches. And uh, it was a pedestrian, there were a lot of like, prostitutes in the neighborhood. And I became friendly with them, one in particular that uh, became my friend, and I was a friend of her. She got married and had two daughters by her husband, and uh, I was friendly with them. Then another, uh, I, had, I had a hernia all opened up because of the hard work I was doing, so they operated on that, and I couldn't do hard work anymore. So. I went to the city of Toronto and uh, asked them to look for a job and they needed somebody with chemical knowledge mm -hmm. to work on a project they were doing called Household Hazardous Waste. Okay. So I was working at that and it was not stressful, there's no stress. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you look back on my working history. It was my job which caused me the most stress mm -hmm. because uh, it was, uh, I was lying about my medical history to get the job and that right. makes it worse. Right. But the thing is that I felt I had no choice because all my job experience was at work that is inherently um, uh, um, stressful. and. If I tried to look for a job like that, I wouldn't get anything. I'd have to be on welfare. I, I, I didn't know what else to do.
But this job that I had for the city of Toronto, I worked on it for nine years. I only had <clears throat> very brief, I think I had one or maybe two attacks of depression, but I just took time off for a day or two and got over it. One time the, the drugstore gave me the wrong pills. I went to the Propromazine and they gave me something else. And just after one day, I knew they were the wrong pills. And I went back to them and I just took two days off and maybe another day some other time. But I, I, did, I did have an attack of mania because my family doctor, who was giving me my pills, said I could go off lithium. And I went off lithium for several years. But one day I was coming home on the bus from my job with the city and just like that I was manic. I could tell. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. called my, my psychiatrist mm -hmm. and uh, and he said, get back on your on your lithium, don't go into work and see me. So I was mm -hmm. off work for about uh, two weeks, sick leave, mm -hmm. and uh, everything calmed down. And uh, so I guess the biggest factor in my recovery was getting out of high stress jobs mm -hmm. and getting into lower stress. Right. I guess that even though maybe I became ill, a doctor suggested that my illness may have started when I was pr promoted way above my years in school. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, that happened. Right. But I think I don't want to repeat myself, but I, I okay. that's that's the best word. And sure. also having these friends in the in the uh, in Toronto, these girls, prostitutes, they liked me. They they told me I had a good name there, and I didn't take advantage of them. They would invite me to play pinball with them, and uh, I would chat with them. And especially this one girl in particular, I've uh, she's got a boyfriend now. I try not to give her money, but she often comes at me for money, and I give her money, but. I've got a good salary and I, I, I'm i doing okay. And you said you had godchildren? Well that's her, her children. Her children. Yeah, her yeah. son that she had by a boyfriend and her two daughters that she had by a, uh, by, a uh, by her husband. Her husband got uh, deported. This is the second part of my interview with John Patterson. My name is Anna Kwan. This is the Our Voices Matter project. We're filming here um, at the Gorsberg Institute on October 19, 2010. Um, John, you just said something interesting. You said it wasn't your medical treatment that made you better. No. Can you tell me what a little bit more about what it was that made you better? A little bit more. Well, a little bit more. I guess it was uh, getting away from the Maritimes, moving to a big city, moving to a large city, um, uh, having a four-year vacation from steady work. Four years. Actually, it was five years, but the last year wasn't the best because I had a hernia. I couldn't do hard work. But those four years of just getting welfare, um, getting paid under the table, so to speak, and being physically fit, sleeping well, that's very important. Right now, I don't sleep well, that's just an aside. I have a bladder condition which gets me up several times a night. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. But then getting a job which was low stress and high paying at the same time, it was, I made good money. I saved a lot of money and this money is going to go to these children in Toronto that I befriended. I'm going to see that they're well looked after right. and I'm going to, uh, I've got to make up my will to decide uh, who else is going to get it. But um, in a nutshell, I, oh yes, there was a self-help group in Toronto called the um, Moon Disorder Association that I became involved in. And I did volunteer work with them answering the phones and uh, that was good. Okay. That, that was uh, people helping each other right. and uh, that. But they don't, they don't, they're not, uh, they don't try to uh, <coughs> um, 
get into conflict with the medical establishment, this uh, self-help group is. They don't try to say that they weren't sick and that the doctors are, are bad. They don't do it that way. They, no. they help, they work with the system. Okay. Yeah. And is that, is that what you appreciate about them? Or yes, I like, I like that about them. They, they, you, you don't deny. There's no good on denying that you're sick. You can't, you can't deny it. Uh, well, maybe, maybe some people. Well, a lot of, a lot of people do. A lot of people do. They blame everybody. But uh, to my case, in my, in my case, I don't try to blame anybody. It happened, and that's just, just, just the way it happened. Right. And uh, maybe I made some bad choices in my life. Maybe I did that. But. Uh, well, what about your life today? Can you describe it for me? It's quite dull. It, it revolves around the, uh, the connections where I do, uh, I go there every day, very seldom miss a day. Um, connections Clubhouse. Yes. Yeah. It's no longer called a Clubhouse though. They, oh, okay. they decided they didn't want to call it a Clubhouse anymore. I have my own ideas why they didn't. Because the word got out in the street that it was a, a good place to join because oh. they had food at, at low prices and a good place to drop in. So I guess for that they wanted to make sure that it, it stayed as a place for people who had uh, issues. Yeah. And um, when I get home from that, I, um, well, I, I eat my, as many meals there as I can. When I get home I watch TV. Uh, my family doesn't, isn't very close to me anymore. Well, they're not very close. But um, I, on the other hand, I, I feel that I've lost confidence in myself now. I mean, I, I, I feel like I can't, there's a lot of things I can't do anymore. I got arthritis in my legs, so I've, I can't, uh, I, and I've lost my strength. Mm -hmm. I used to be fairly strong. I'm not strong anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just get through, I go down to the YMCA and exercise there. Uh, I don't read anymore. I, I, my eyesight's too poor to read. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, my, and uh, so my everyday life isn't that great. I live for the week mm -hmm. through the clubhouse. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask why you came back to Nova Scotia when you felt Toronto was a a healthy place for you? Well, I came back because I was persuaded by a psychiatrist who was not good, good, a good influence mm -hmm. to take medical, medical termination. Oh. And uh, so, of course, he, he made up the reports. And, um, but he was trying to get me into a nursing home that he had in Brantford. And, uh, of course, when I saw that, I knew I made a mistake, but anyway, the, the, the work was done now. They put me in for a Canada pension and put me in for a disability pension with the City of Toronto. Right. And I came back here because once I left my job, I didn't have much to live for there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a restaurant there that was my favorite restaurant. I used to eat there a lot. Mm -hmm. It closed up. Oh. And um, I... Uh, I just felt that uh, my brother in Toronto, here in Halifax, he's now dead, but he suggested I come back here where I could live cheaper, yeah. and I did. Mm. But uh, do you, what kind of social supports do you make use of here? Um, connections Clubhouse is one, I, or Club Connections is one. Um, are there other th sort of community organizations or people who are in your life that help you? Uh, make like help your uh, help you to keep your well being. No, that's what it. No it's connections. connections. Do you um, I see a therapist out at Bears Road okay. once every five or six weeks. Yeah. Um, I don't see my psychiatrist at all hardly now. I only see him but once a year. Yeah. And um, do you have many friends or? Um, no, I don't. No. Not even through connections. No. No. Okay. Um, so, 
when you, so it, after the nine years in Toronto, you took medical termination from your job, and then you yeah, came here. Yeah. Okay. I worked nine years there with the, yeah. with the city, but before that, I think I was five years uh, without a job, okay. without a steady job. Right, right, okay. Um, so, what if what could make life better for you here as a person living with a mental illness? I. I would say having a drop-in center that was open all week long and, uh, and where I could uh, do, um, <clears throat> do the, the job that I now do with Connections, you know, I always find something to do there um, to help out, I try to, or else just sit around and relax. And, um, what about um, your spiritual life? Do, do you have a, a, a sort of a faith or a, some... Uh, well, yes, I do. I go to the Unitarian Church on English Street. Okay. And um, I sometimes, I haven't gone to the United Church for a long time, but I go there and um, I just enjoy being with people there. I don't really find that I get a lot out of their sermons sometimes. They're, they, they ask, uh, they, they're sort of, uh, oh, I can't interpret the religion to them. Perhaps you should go yourself and find out what they're about. Maybe you do know anyway. Well, I've been there once. Um, once, yeah. Once or twice, the Unitarian Church. I've heard a bit about it. Um, yeah, but I, I know that there's quite a community of people there, friendly people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so um, if you were, if you were to look back on your life with a mental illness, can you tell me what's changed in your in the treatment and in like regard to discrimination or stigma? Anything that you could reflect back on and you know that's changed. Um. For the better or for the worse, I guess. Well, I'm not one of these people that dwells on stigma. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe I have suffered from it in the case of, of getting employment, but damn it, it's true. I, I, uh, I got myself into uh, a line of work which was stressful and which I wasn't fit for because I couldn't get anything else. I guess the only thing that could help me was um, sympathetic people that would got, get me work where I could support myself, mm -hmm. even with the, I don't know what to call it stigma or, or what, well perhaps it is stigma. I know that at this oil company I dealt with where I was up in, a, in the oil camp up, mm -hmm. up north, mm -hmm. when I got back to the office they were furious with me. The, the my, my boss said, I don't want somebody here who has a mental illness. I want out of here. And the uh, personnel manager wasn't very happy with me either. He was shouting at me. And uh, wow. so that that was, I don't know what you call it stigma or, or what you'd call it, but uh, that hurt. Yeah. And um, they, didn't, they weren't helpful to me at all. Mm -hmm. But then the, um, I didn't hide anything from them, and, uh, but I realized I had no future with them anymore. Right. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, because I, um, I think that's one thing that maybe has changed a bit is employers' responsibilities towards um, you know, their, their employees that have mental health issues. Yeah. Now more... I mean, under law, we are supposed to be, not not to be discriminated against. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So yeah, that's a good point. Um.
Is there anything that you'd like to add about your story um, or about uh, living with a mental illness? No, I can't think of anything. We've, I've certainly talked a lot about my life to you, of course. I've left out some things. I mean, I, I, I would bore you, uh, not bore you, but just confuse you if I told you about all the things I've done in my life. After all, I'm 71, and uh, in 71 years, to bring it all down to an hour and a half is pretty difficult. But I feel I've, I've done, I've touched the, uh, touched up. If there's anything you review, that you review on that you'd like to have clarified, sure. you can get in touch with me anytime. Okay. Um, there's nothing I want to add. Uh, just that um, I wish that I had taken a wife and uh, had a little girl to sit on my knee and call me daddy. Oh. And uh, this is something I haven't got, but I've got those children in Toronto that I'm going to try to take care of. Right. They're not young kids anymore. They're uh, one girl is almost 19. The other girl is. Mo, I don't know how she old she is, about 25, and mm -hmm. the boy is 18, and uh, right. uh, so I've got them. But it's too late to, 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 to cry about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm 71 years old. I do have a 91-year-old friend, mm -hmm. but I just can't bring myself to date her. I mean, she's a nice yeah. woman, but there's too much money to gap there. Sure. But on the other hand, I'd like to find a... A 51-year-old girl <laughs> to take a woman to take out, uh, my, or some of my own age right. to take out. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One more thing I want to ask you. Sure. Because you you mentioned last night that one reason you want to tell your story is you think it might help others, and I guess I want to know what would your advice be to people who look at your story or hear your story, um, and maybe are coping with a mental illness themselves. Well, I'd say try not to see stigma. You know, I, I feel that don't stigmatize yourself. You know, maybe, you know, that um, try to cooperate with people who are trying to help you. you know, don't argue as much as you feel you should because. Um, you know they're trying to help you, and if you, uh, I, I, I've known people that uh, that were at war with the psychiatrists, yeah, and uh, they were hurting themselves. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are trying to help you, and don't be too stubborn right. by insisting that you're okay, that the system is all wrong. Right. Okay. I know that I, I know one woman who. Uh, well, she has Parkinson's disease now, but I met her through uh, connections, mm -hmm. and she had taken a uh, master's degree in counseling from right. some phony college, or oh, a college gave a three-month course or something like that, mm -hmm. master of counseling or something like that, and she said she was getting the wrong treatment. What she needed was another kind of treatment, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, try not to uh, question uh, too much about what you're getting. I know in my own case, perhaps I, I but uh, you know, my, my I, gosh, I, I think I've said as much as I can. Okay, I, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for sharing your story. Well, thank you. Okay. And uh, as I say, if there's anything that's um, confusing or that you feel should be dealt with further, just give me a call. Will do. Okay. okay, thank you very much. All right then.